Hi folks, HR Funk here. If you remember about six months ago, I made a video called The Budget High Power. In that video, I talked about the difficulty I had had trying to locate an actual Browning High Power pistol in my area. And if you've watched any number of my previous videos, you know that I have something of a penchant for firearms with historical significance. And the Browning High Power is absolutely a historically significant firearm. So flash forward to this past week, after almost a year of searching, I finally came across an actual Browning High Power, and I have it here to show you today. And here we have it. After almost a year of searching, my own FN manufactured, Browning imported, GP35 High Power pistol. Specifically, my pistol is a Mark III, which as you can see, is more the military slash police slash combat version, or maybe I should say current combat version, of the high power pistol. And I say that because historically the high power has always been a combat firearm. As I've said in previous videos, this was designed, or at least the initial design work was done by the late great John Moses Browning. It was finished by Dudene Saive. Uh, who was an engineer with FN, and the final product was originally unveiled in 1935, and it has been with us ever since. The high power pistol has gone through an evolution during that time. Basically, there has been a series of improvements to the pistol itself, but largely this is still exactly the same pistol that first saw the light of day in 1935. There have been a number of videos, and if you search YouTube or you search the internet, you're going to find all kinds of videos that talk about the history of the high power pistol. Rather than reiterate that for the umpteen hundredth time, or umpteen thousandth time maybe, I thought what I would do is, oh by the way, if you're interested in the history, by all means go back, research it, there's a ton of information out there. But what I wanted to do with this video was look at the high power from a perspective of a modern day fighting handgun. There are some folks that are of the impression that the high power really has gotten too long in the tooth and in this current age with all of the modern firearms out there the high power is more or less obsolete. Now it's interesting that the 1911 which predates the high power by about what 25 years or thereabouts 24 years uh, most people still consider a viable fighting firearm or a vi viable fighting pistol, but the high power, a lot of people think, really has passed its prime and is more of a novelty and curio these days than an actual viable option for people that need to defend themselves, and particularly professionals in the military or law enforcement that need to defend themselves. I'm not sure that I share that opinion, and I thought what I would do to try to give this video some context is compare my new high power. By the way, I say new to it's new to me. The firearm, as best I can tell, is unfired, although it has been previously owned. This particular Mark III was manufactured in 1994, and as best I can tell, has spent the last 23 years in its box in a safe somewhere because the pistol itself looks brand new and again I can't tell that it's even been fired. But in order to give this this video some context I thought what I would do is compare it side by side with my Smith & Wesson M&P 2.0 which at this juncture is about four months old. So we have a 23 year old firearm based on an 81 year old design going against or being compared to and contrasted with a firearm that has been around for just a few months. Now, of course, the M&P has been with us for about a decade, but this particular variation of the M&P is virtually brand new. So I thought this might be kind of fun to see how far we've come in about 80 years with all of the design and engineering enhancements that have come since the Browning High Power and into the modern day defensive pistols. Before we get into the compare and contrast, what do we think of the high power today as a modern day fighting pistol, or maybe I should say as a fighting pistol in the modern age? The high power is a short recoil single action pistol with a linkless tilting barrel design that was originally devised by John Moses Browning. Now, one of the things that we should note 
specifically with the high power is many many modern day pistols have borrowed that linkless tilting barrel design from the high power when we look at modern day glocks hk smith and wessons they all use some variation of the linkless locking system that was originally devised in the browning high power so to whatever degree we want to talk about the modern day firearms that have advanced from the p35 many of them probably most of them use the same system for locking and unlocking the ver the barrel from the slide or at least a variation of that system for unlocking the barrel from the slide the next thing i'll talk about is magazine capacity historically the p35 pistol has had a 13 round magazine in fact that's where it gets its name back in 1935 13 rounds in a pistol magazine was considered very high capacity in fact the french name for the pistol grand puissance actually means high power or high capacity which is a reference to the 13 round magazine now by modern standards a lot of firearms today or a lot of handguns today have magazines that hold 17 18 maybe 20 rounds so you might look at that and think wow we've got about a 30 percent increase in magazine capacity with the modern day handguns but there's no reason to think that the high power itself doesn't benefit from some of the modern day engineering enhancements what i have here with me is a 15 round magazine for the high power this is a mechgar magazine and it holds 15 rounds it brings the 81 year old pistol to within two rounds of the brand new smith and wesson m p and it actually puts it on the same plane as something like the Beretta 92 and some of the other double stack pistols out there that have a 15 round magazine. Now again, 15 is now slowly starting to move down the capacity ladder a little bit and we're seeing those higher capacities, but still 81 year old pistol within two rounds of the modern day pistol and obviously with one in the chamber that gives you 16 rounds that you would have available to defend yourself. I think even by today's standards, 16 rounds is a respectable number. So for the folks that think the high power is past its prime and getting to the point of obsolescence, I don't necessarily think you can point to capacity as something as one of the criteria that you would use to make that pronouncement. How about the category of weight? The high power weighs in at about 35 ounces, give or take. The M&P 2.0 is about 25 ounces, so it is about, well, it's about half a pound or a little over half a pound lighter than the high power. So a lot of people would look at that and think, wow, we've got a fantastic pistol here that's over half a pound lighter than the 81-year-old pistol, and that's true. But what does that weight do for us? Now, the M&P is a very comfortable pistol to shoot. I will be the first one to say that. Uh, if you look back at my review I did of this particular pistol, I gave it a very favorable review. I enjoy shooting it. I was just shooting it again a couple of days ago, and it's a very nice pistol to shoot. But the additional weight of the high power and the additional barrel length, the barrel of the high power is about half an inch, give or take, longer than the barrel of the M&P 2.0. So again, that helps a little bit with your recoil management because it helps the extra weight I should say, helps dampen the recoil of the high-power pistol. Again, to make it a little bit more controllable. And we'll see this when we get out to the range. I am going to shoot this, so we're going to make it to the range before long. Not shot it yet, looking forward to it. But when we get out to the range, we'll look at that controllability with the high-power and maybe even contrast it against the M&P 2.0 and see just how the two compare when we're actually firing them. One of the things the P35 pistol was historically known for was this grip contour. Many, many people over the years have talked about how naturally the high power points and how well it fits their hand, and that is absolutely true. There are some people that are actually somewhat critical of the Mark III's plastic grips. I've gotta say, they feel good for me. I've seen some people complain that shooting two-handed with the thumb rest over here somehow is uncomfortable or awkward. I don't notice that. when I. Hold this in a two-handed grip it feels very good to me there's nothing that feels particularly awkward about it now maybe for some of those folks they hold the pistol somewhat differently and that causes them some problems but i don't have that issue it always feels good to me it always points very naturally 
And I've got to say, I agree with those folks over the years, or maybe I should say over the decades, that have complemented the high power because of the grip contour, the way it fits their hand, and the pointability of the pistol. And I think in a defensive pistol, even in modern times, that pointability, that natural pointing of the pistol, bringing it up on target, and when it comes up on target, the sights naturally line up with your eyes, helps you with your shot placement, especially for a quick shot where you come up and have to squeeze one off in order to make sure that shot stays somewhere effectively on the target. Okay, now we're up to what historically has been one of the greatest criticisms of the P35 high power, and that is the trigger pull. There's, there's two major criticisms of the high power. First is the trigger pull being heavy and gritty, and second, and closely related, is the magazine disconnect safety, which is part of what makes the trigger pull heavy and gritty, and also it prevents the magazines from falling free when you're reloading. Let's look at the trigger pull first. And before we test the trigger, we're going to make sure that the pistol is unloaded. And we can see magazine's empty, chamber is empty, so we're not going to have any problems. Let me do this. Now I'm going to use my brand new Lyman trigger pull scale, and we're going to see where this trigger breaks. Six pounds, 1.4 ounces, just a little over six pounds. Let's try that again. Five pounds, 10.9 ounces. So about five and three quarter pounds, just shy of five and three quarter pounds. Let's try one more. Five pounds, 11.2 ounces. So this trigger is breaking right around six pounds, a little over, a little under. Most of the times that I check it, it's a little under. Six pounds on a defensive firearm is really about where you want it. You don't want it to be extremely light. This is not a target gun. And I think part of the criticism that the high powers get periodically, or the trigger of the high power gets, is because people are expecting this thing to be a target firearm, a range firearm. This is a fighting pistol, and it has a fighting pistol trigger. Now, I have seen people talk about trigger pulls that are up 9 pounds, somewhere around there with their high powers. That is extremely heavy. But on this pistol, trigger pull of around 5 and 3 quarters, 6 pounds, that's about where you want it. You do not want a hair trigger on a pistol that you're going to be using in a defensive situation when the adrenaline is pumping and you've got to come up and you've got your finger on the trigger you want it to be a deliberate pull but you don't want it to be so heavy that it's going to pull the, the pistol off target so again at least with my high power i'm very very happy with that trigger on my charles daly pistol that i've replaced the trigger springs on and done some other work on it that breaks at about five and a half this one with no work whatsoever breaks right around six pounds and that's about where i like it in the interest of comparing and contrasting, let's see where the trigger on the 2.0 M&P breaks. First, again, a little safety check. There is no magazine in here and nothing in the chamber. And nothing up my sleeve. Six pounds, 5.1 ounces. Let's try it again. Five pounds, 3.5 ounces.
5 pounds, 15 ounces. So the M&P really is pretty close to the high power as far as the weight where the trigger breaks. Again, after all these decades of engineering advancements since the high power was originally devised, not seeing a lot of difference in the trigger. Additionally, with the 2.0, I've got the trigger take up, it stops, I hit the wall, and when I press past that, I get a nice break. With the high power, I've got take up, it hits a wall, and I have a nice break. And the break on the high power actually is better than the break on the M&P. How about the dreaded magazine safety? The biggest problem I see with the magazine safety is that after you fire the last round and you hit the magazine release, it does not fall free from the pistol. You can see that it starts to come out, but it doesn't fall. I really see this as nothing more than a training issue. If you're reloading the high power and the slide is locked open and you hit the magazine release, all you have to do is pull it out of there, insert your new magazine, and you're back up and ready to shoot. Again, nothing more than a training issue. You get used to doing that, hit the magazine release, pull that out, reinsert your new magazine, and you're back in the fight just that quick. I don't really see it being any longer to reload the high power than you typically would with any other semi-auto. How about the sights on the high power? The Mark III has three white bars, which work very similar to the three white dots. Just another version of the high visibility sight system. Now the sights on the high power have evolved. They started out back in 1935 very similar to the original 1911 sights, which is to say they were very small and they did not give the greatest sight picture. The sights on the Mark III, as you just saw, are quite serviceable. And when we compare them to the M&P 2.0, we see that 80 odd years later, We've got basically the same system. And it doesn't really matter the manufacturer. Just about everyone out there has some version of a three white dot or two dots where you line one up over the other or some variation of that. But the sighting systems, again, on the Mark III high power as compared to the newer pistols is very comparable. Probably the last criticism of the high power for folks at least who don't like the high power is the fact that since it's a single action semi-auto you do have to click off the thumb safety if it's cocked and locked and you're coming up to shoot. In the mind of some folks that extra step is something that particularly under stress they don't want to have to deal with. Again I see this as very similar to the 1911. The safety works almost identical to the 1911 safety it's just something that in the course of deploying the pistol, you've got to train. Again, it's another training issue. So that's enough talking about the high power indoors. Let's head out to the range and do some shooting and see how the Mark III high power performs.